the biggest volcano that we have in our solar system. Everyone's definition of a hellscape. Ice volcanoes are really interesting for microbial life that could be potentially living there today. So, aliens. Aliens, yeah. <laughs> Volcanoes are ultimately a way of getting stuff that's inside a planet out into the outside of a planet. You know, that's ultimately what it's all about. It's all about that planet releasing heat um, and also just kind of spewing out material out onto the surface, even the moons as well. So our own moon um, was also covered in volcanoes and had huge volcanic eruptions much earlier in its history. When you look at the, the dark patches on the moon, that's huge lava flows, you know, that erupted billions of years ago. The Olympus Mons on Mars is an absolutely gargantuan volcano. It's the biggest volcano that we have in our solar system. The actual space it covers on the surface is kind of the equivalent to the size of France. Um, and it actually reaches up into space about 25 kilometers, you know, which is about three Everests all stacked up on top of one another. When we're looking at Mars or when we're looking at the Moon, um, we're very much looking at volcanoes which are, you know, extinct or at best dormant. Io, um, which is a moon around Jupiter, is the complete opposite. Uh, so Io has about 400 volcanoes kind of littered across its surface, um, which just gives you a sense of just how volcanically active um, this little moon actually is. Io, I think, is everyone's kind of stereotypical definition of a, of a kind of hellscape. You know, it's just sort of nuts, the amount of volcanism and volcanic activity that we, we see on that moon. It's kind of fire and sulfur and brimstone and all this kind of thing, you know. So you have huge pools of, of sort of molten lava everywhere. So it has these huge fire fountains, which go up to about 500 kilometers out into space um, from the surface of that moon. kinds of volcanoes which I like and that I'm really interested in um, are the kinds of volcanoes that can interact with water. Um, or volcanoes which are actually entirely um, revolving around ice altogether, so ice volcanoes. We typically find ice volcanoes in the outer solar system, um, so beyond the asteroid belt. So ice volcanoes are in some ways quite similar to what we otherwise think of as our kind of traditional rocky volcano here on Earth. And um, it's the same process of, you know, getting stuff from inside a planet or the moon to the outside surface. Um, it's just the, the actual material that's being erupted is water and ice rather than lava and rock. So when we think about the icy moons in the outer solar system, um, beneath that icy crust, they actually have um, either a lens or, a, or an ocean of liquid water. Um, and that's ultimately then what's going to be erupted onto the surface uh, to form these ice volcanoes. Um, so like the moon Enceladus, for example, it's an icy moon around uh, Saturn. It actually has these huge plumes um, which emanate out of its south polar region. They actually reach out to about 700 kilometers beyond this little tiny moon. Um, and they actually reach so far that these plumes actually then contribute to one of the sort of very thin rings around Saturn. Because we have such amazing technology now, we can actually fly through the plumes of Enceladus, for example, and actually measure the chemistry um, within those plumes and, and see what, what that information can tell us. Ice volcanoes are really interesting for microbial life that could be potentially living there today um, as a sort of um, example of an extraterrestrial environment that, that could actually be feasibly habitable for extreme forms of life. Anyway, when we want to explore the solar system, that's obviously a super challenging thing to do. Um, so somewhere like Enceladus, which is actually already kind of spewing out a lot of this um, material onto the actual surface of that moon for us to go and explore looking for evidence of, of life beyond Earth. 
So, aliens. Aliens, yeah. <laughs> microbial, um, microbial aliens. So we can actually use uh, terrestrial microorganisms um, kind of taken from, again, similar kinds of environments here on Earth, you know, perhaps really salty environments or really cold environments, um, and then, you know, kind of subject them to these kinds of uh, extraterrestrial environments um, to see how they behave and whether or not they survive, um, and also what other chemicals they might produce, um, which will then be left behind for, uh, for us to actually find. So microbes are amazing um, because you know they can harness all kinds of um, different chemicals to you know to use as their food basically. Um, so you can have uh, microbes which can get energy by um, sort of using sulfur, for example, or iron, which is present in the, in the rocks around them. Um, and those are the kinds of elements that we get around volcanic systems as well, which is why volcanoes are so interesting um, in terms of thinking about habitable environments for life. Um, so volcanoes kind of locally deliver a lot of these kinds of elements, which, which life can use for um, getting energy. And that's why we think that there could be places out there in the solar system um, which could actually be harboring life, perhaps on these icy moons kind of at this present day, which, you know, to us are really extreme places, um, but perhaps to um, a microbe living there is, is kind of just fine. It is a matter of time now as to you know, at least being able to answer the question whether or not um, there either has ever been life beyond Earth or if there is in fact somewhere else in the solar system currently inhabited by, by living things. Um, it will almost certainly be something like, you know, microorganisms. So I think either way it's exciting. If we do find life elsewhere, that's obviously incredible. Um, but likewise, if we don't find any life anywhere, then that just makes Earth even more special. I wish more people appreciated microbes. <laughs> you know, they're just everywhere. And uh, yeah, microbes should be appreciated. <laughs> I was knocked over by the blast and was knocked unconscious. There was a, a walnut-sized piece of my brain missing, so that could explain my personality. <laughs> I'm going mad! I was just smitten by it. I said I had to see the top and understand how this volcano works. Erebus Volcano is the southernmost active volcano in the world. It is in the Ross Sea of Antarctica, 3,800 meters high. It's one of the larger volcanoes in the world. The wonderful thing about Erebus is we have this lava lake Erebus breathes, the lava lake going up and down. When it comes up, there's a little puff of gas and it goes back down. Erebus is a living volcano because it breathes. And so by looking at the lava lake, we're actually looking inside the volcano. It's like having a window in your chest so you could see your heart. Now, the characteristic feature of Erebus is this persistent gas plume, which comes from the mantle, which comes from 100 kilometers down. Gas is the driving force for volcanoes. Gases make volcanoes erupt. So the gas leaks out from gas vents all around the volcano. But Erebus, being in Antarctica, gets hellishly cold in winter down to minus 60 degrees or so. And the gas that leaks out around the side hits the air and freezes, making these fumarolic ice towers. When you just go there for the first time, and you don't realize that virtually under every ice tower is a big ice cave system. There's literally hundreds of ice caves gas vents that are leaking up from inside the volcano come up, melt the snow, melt the ice, and then form these big chambers and tunnels that wind around. There are these beautiful ice crystals that grow on the walls, exquisite looking, and they're sort of like fairyland. The interesting aspect is inside the caves, there is microbiological activity 
and so because it's warm there's a lot of interest to understand the different microbes that are down there. Now Erebus is such an extreme environment this could provide insight into possibility of life on a place like Mars. Right from the very beginning, one of the prime objectives for work on Erebus was to try and get a sample of the gas. Erebus, the volcano itself, compositionally is very different from any other volcano in the world. Sampling any high temperature gas in any volcano means you've got to be right down there, right in the bowels of the volcano. So it was always our dream and desire to get down into the inner crater that started this quest. Doing that at Erebus was almost frightening in many ways, but we decided to give it a try. We were just a bunch of silly scientists, but we didn't have the experience of winches and climbing in there. Erebus has these little small eruptions, molten magma just rises rapidly up, it's been driven by gas in and explodes. And on Erebus, these sorts of eruptions throw out these big lava bombs, big fat blobs of molten rock that go up two or three hundred meters in the air, sometimes higher, and then they'll just drop back down. In 1974, we climbed down the main crater walls, I happened to be in the crater with one other person when one of these eruptions occurred. These rocks were just dropping out of the sky around us and they go thunk and then you hear this hissing sound as the snow starting to melt. I was knocked over by the blast and was knocked unconscious and as I was coming to these rocks were all falling down around me. When we left the crater somewhat shell-shocked, two of us just flopped down on the crater rim looking down at the camp where everybody was just thinking we're lucky to be alive. A couple of years ago I had an MRI on my head and the doctors came up with a surprising find that there was a, a walnut sized piece of my brain missing and uh, they said well I must have been concussed and I must have had some head injury. So the assumption is that that eruption just wiped out a bit of my brain, so that could explain my personality. There was an eruption from the active vent, exactly the same as the one that I'd experienced earlier. Bombs were flying through the air, scared us off, and that was really the last attempt sending a person into the crater to get gas. Arabus has really become uh, a big part of my life, been my uh, heart and soul. I have spent 44 birthdays in Antarctica, mostly on Erebus. The steaming volcano behind me is my birthday cake. This is a world of great contrasts, and especially when you think about temperature. Here you have this permanent, persistent lava lake. It's 1,000 degrees Celsius but when you're up on the crater rim, you're always looking for ways to warm yourself. One way is to find areas of warm ground, and there are some places where there is warm ground that it is over 60 degrees Celsius at about a foot depth. These are great places to cook turkeys. So we have actually cooked turkeys and had Christmas dinner by burying turkey and leave them there for two days and they cook. 2016 was the last time. It's time to move on and uh, let young people do it. There's lots of new technology. I'm old school, so it's time for the, the, the young studs to come along and do something new and interesting. In Greek mythology, Erebus is the gateway to Hades or hell. So if you want to go to Erebus, you get to pass through Erebus on your way to hell. 
So I've spent a lot of time standing up on the crater rim of Erebus, watching all these souls descending to hell. So get out, live it up, and go to hell, and you'll see Erebus. C'est vraiment quelque chose de incroyable. Tellement c'est beau et tellement c'est hostile. Karena itu mata saya tidak pakai lindung gitu, jadi polos mata sama asap. Woi, kosong, 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 kosong. Like climbing down into Dante's Inferno. Ribati beri, nyolirang kosong. Ya, ya, ya. And yet that intense blue lake that is so inviting. I mean, it really does look like a huge swimming pool. But you know that it's a swimming pool of pure acid. Every volcano has its own personality. And what's fascinating about Kauijin is it's the world's largest hyperacidic lake. The acidity is on par, if not more concentrated than what you would find in any car battery. But it's this beautiful, very often iridescent blue lake. We actually stopped a tourist who was up to her knees in this acid lake and about to go for a dive into this beautiful blue lagoon. And so one of the reasons that the, uh, the lake is acid is that we have these volcanic acid gases coming up from beneath the volcano and turning the lake into this incredible acid soup. Um, and those gases are incredibly hot. Blasts of at minimum 150 to 300 degrees Celsius. And the local miners have actually installed these ceramic pipes to take the volcanic gases, the sulf sulfuric gases, and condense them into pure sulfur that they chisel away and mine and then carry out of this uh, crater, carrying very often 70 to 80 kilograms of, of this native sulfur. La plupart des gens qui travaillent dans le volcan ont des ennuis de santé, des ennuis, des, des problèmes aux poumons, des problèmes pour respirer, tout ça pour un salaire de 4 à 5 euros par jour. The gases that the miners are breathing in um, are sulfuric acid droplets. That's just terrible for, for any human. We were wearing full face masks and even then you can feel your skin start to tingle as the, the gases, droplets of these, this acid, uh, start to react with your skin over time. Sing to a belong, Pucho, Salamut, Anna, your Salamut. If you look at that dome at night, then it really changes again because you start to see the burning sulfur. So you actually see tiny little rivulets, almost lava flows of sulfur, and they're combusting. And at night, they're actually burning blue. So you have this incredible contrast of colors with jets of blue-red flame and the miners still working in this incredible environment uh, just by small headlamps trying to keep mining at the sulfur. En plus euh, des mineurs dans le, dans le cratère, il y a aussi les gens qu'on appelle les pompiers. Oh, 
Nah, putle, putle. Nah, terus. Nanti isi beli sedikit. Karena itu mata saya tidak pakai lindung gitu, jadi polos mata sama asap. Habis itu mengeluarkan air terus mata saya. Oh, ibu le, segede ibu di sini. Wah, mbak ubel nak aku sampai anu? Iyo, kena pelaki bakaran ni. Mati kah besok? Iya, meripati apa peri? Meripati peri. Nyalirang kobong apa peri? Bagi bapa kalau api itu sudah padam, hatinya bapa itu senang. Pekerjaan sudah ringan, tapi tinggal capeknya saja di situ. Payah bapa urat-urat bapa seperti habis gitulah. You know, as humans, we like to think we control things, and then we look at a, a system like an exploding volcano, and we really recognize that we can't control these. What's going to happen next? We still don't have an ability to predict any volcanic eruption. In the case of Kauijian, it's even more complicated because we get these very small events. So we need to keep trying to study these systems, especially relatively easily accessible volcanoes where we can perfect our understanding of the physics, the chemistry, the changes that are happening in that volcano before it erupts. Can we eventually get to one stage uh, in the future where we have sufficiently good understanding, enough instrumentation around that volcano that we can warn people it's becoming dangerous, those miners need to move. But we've got a long way to go, um, even at Kauijin. So my name is uh, Gro Birkefeldt Miller Pedersen, and I'm a geologist, and I'm working on the eruption on Reykjanes Peninsula at Fagradalsfjall volcano. Fagradalsfjall volcano basically means the beautiful valley mountain volcano. So Fagrad means beautiful, Dal means valley, and Fjall means mountain. So Fagradalsfjall volcano. Reykjanes Peninsula is basically the southwest corner of Iceland and we have five volcanic systems across the peninsula, one of which is the Fagradalsfjall volcanic system. There was this big earthquake on the 24th of February. As the magma is trying to find its way up through the crust, the crust often breaks a little bit in order to accommodate space for this magma and that creates earthquakes. There was more than 50,000 earthquakes. I've never felt so many earthquakes in my life. They were very intense. And on the 19th of March, we got the first eruptive fissure in Geldingadal. And that's the first time since uh, 800 years that Reykjanes have had an eruption. And this specific volcanic system has not erupted for 6,000 6, years. When an and a volcano is erupting for the first time in like modern times. It's really a unique window into understanding those volcanic systems. Volcanoes are all different and they work differently. You have actually been able to see new fissures open like that, which is remarkable, <laughs> really amazing. I, I would say it's, it's, it's rather addicting. I, I don't think you get like, okay, seen that and done, done that. At least not if you have geological background. <laughs> then you're like, I want more. <laughs> Some of the things we have been doing and I have been doing specifically are, of course, we are trying to figure out the volume of the eruption and how much volume are being emitted per second. That is done by surveys from air, either from satellite or from planes. 
where you take pictures and you construct uh, topographic models. What we are trying to do is partly understanding where the lava will go. So right now it's ponding and it's moving a bit to the south, but one of the other options that the lava can do if it keeps on filling up the, va uh, the valley is basically going out this valley here towards the east and then flow into the other valleys. It's a bit more complicated than, for instance, water. As soon as some of the lava has cooled, it's basically creating a barrier or obstacle for the lava that is being emitted afterwards. So constantly the topography is changing when you have lava flows evolving. I feel like every day I'm not going to feel them. I'm, I'm a little bit sad <laughs> because I would like to. I would like to follow it and see how it evolves. Uh, so you are, I think you are awestruck every time you come in to the uh, in the field and you see how the landscape have been changing. But of course, it can also be quite frustrating at times. Uh, on Friday, when we were in the field last, it was basically so much gas, and and uh, we now have multiple sources. So each fissure segment is emitting gas. So from the cones, you can see there are gas plumes coming out. And this gas is something you have to be aware of when you're walking around here in the field because it's bad for you. It can be poisonous if, you, if it's too high concentrations. So right now, after the two latest fissures have opened up, the situation is much more complicated because you have three sources of gas moving around with the wind. Um, so it can also be quite frustrating and of course Icelandic weather is not always playing along either. We, we have been promised uh, clear skies. Uh, so if you have things you really want to do and you cannot do them because of the gas or because there is suddenly a snowstorm, then of course there is some frustration. But I would say overall it, it's, it's amazing to go to the field. You just want to go more. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of work, so you have to like it. You have to be a little bit dedicated. <laughs> or crazy, I don't know. <laughs> so in Iceland, we have uh, approximately 32 or 33 volcanic systems that have produced many, many hundreds of eruptions over time. Uh, and, and, and that is because Iceland is located uh, on the plate boundary between Euroasia and the North American plate that is moving apart. So along the plate boundary, you basically have the plates moving to each side. And uh, when that is happening, you're stretching the crust and new material is coming up from below. And it's basically uh, generating volcanic eruptions that are filling out this material. So you don't end up having two Icelands. <laughs> Uh, but on top of that, we also have a mantle plume, and a mantle plume is basically an area in, deep down under the crust where you have hot rock, and therefore we have these two special conditions, a plate boundary and a mantle plume, that causes extra uh, melt generation and, and causes all the volcanoes and the volcanic eruptions to be placed here in Iceland. And now, Multiple other fissures have opened up, and that is what you see in the back. Some of these fissures have built up cones and are very active, producing a lot of lava. So we don't know when the volcano will stop. That's a million dollar question, and we really would like to predict that, but we just know that right now it seems like the eruption is still unfolding. It's still opening up new fissures, so it doesn't seem to stop right now. And there are geochemical evidence that suggests that it's similar to some of the shield eruptions. And if it's going to be an uh, eruption that produces shield, then we're in for a long ride. But really, the answer is we don't know. Really fast moving lava, 30, 40, even more miles per hour. <laughs> I've just come over the edge. If any of this rock goes here, that's it for both of us. Rock! As you get to the top of the volcano and peer into this huge hole, which has 
walls of a few hundred meters high and over a kilometer in diameter. It's like looking almost into the, the gateway to hell because at the bottom of that hole is the world's largest lava lake. So a few hundred meters in diameter itself. It's a giant orange lake of magma. There is a kind of majesty and an alluring magic to the lava lake because it is so bright it's so orange and it's so dynamic, it's churning like a cauldron. It's just bubbling and whirling, almost like water, but water which is 800 degrees Celsius. I can feel my heart rate going up just putting the harness on. <laughs> Wait till you look over the edge. Yeah. Last bit before we go down, kicking rocks off. If you do kick a rock off, big shout, rock! Okay. One of these rocks hits someone in the head, it'll kill them, even with these helmets on. Okay. A uh, blend of excitement and nerves, I'll be honest with you, yeah. You should enjoy the view first before we go over because after that you're going to be fairly okay. busy. All the while, as the wind swirls within the cauldron, it's bringing off bits of loose rock which tumble down the sides right around your head as you're desperately clinging onto uh, a very thin rope. Ooh. As a geologist, probably one of your dreams is to go into a volcano. But with that comes a significant amount of risk because it's a long way down and you're going into a very hostile environment. Try not to do that because there are sections, if you do that, that the whole slope will go. Yeah. All of this is just waiting to fall. Well, from a scientific point of view, it's critical because some of the instrumentation that you want to put on the volcano needs to be as close to the lava lake as possible. So although it looks incredibly risky, that risk is for a reason. Chris is down. Thanks, Dad. Don't back. look back. So getting down to tier two at the end of the upsail was just a huge relief. We could then start the science. So there are a number of different ways of trying to understand the behavior of volcanoes and also when volcanoes may erupt. And that's because the volcanoes give off a number of different signals. So on our expedition, Kayla, who's a geochemist and a petrologist, somebody who looks at rocks, her objective was to actually look at the gases coming out of the volcano, in particular carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. The real power in gas measurements is that it can tell us about the entire system miles and miles beneath your feet. So that's where the action is. That is the driving force of volcanism. It's uh, controlled deep down in the guts of the volcano. It's really important to know what the levels of those gases are in normal times and then what levels those gases get up to when the volcano is moving towards an eruption and during eruption. If we see all of a sudden a huge spike in the amount of sulfur dioxide that's coming out of the crater, that could be something that happens before an eruption. We're not just concerned with when the volcano is going to erupt, we're also concerned with what will come out of the volcano. Because if we have very, very runny lavas, and these are lavas which are typically quite low in silica, and so those lavas will be able to go from the volcano to the populated areas much more quickly, giving us less time to warn the local populations and for them to evacuate. So one way to try and assess the viscosity or the runniness of lava is actually to go and get samples of lava. Let me show you one of the samples that I collected from the active vent. We can see that uh, this sample is a glassy black matrix. We can see a lot of bubbles here around and a few um, tiny white crystals. We know that the composition of this volcano are low in silica, very low, below 40%, and this makes these lava very fluid, so they have low viscosity. They will be flowing like water along the flanks of the volcano, so I suspect that if there is a new eruption with this composition, it might be flowing even faster than during 2002. That is a clear indication that we need as best possible a warning system to give people chance to remove themselves out of harm's way. This is a custom-built microphone and it's capable of recording sounds beyond the threshold of human hearing. So Jeff is a geophysicist and he has this rather unusual interest in the voice of volcanoes. Volcanoes speak at low frequencies. They generate sounds that we can hear, but they also generate this world of infrasound that we want to recognize and understand so that when that tone changes in the future, we will be able to understand what's going on. As the lava lake level goes up and down, it moves the entire air mass within the crater itself. And the volcano, in essence, sound, is acting like a giant trombone. 
there's air going up and down within there and it, that, that kind of motion of the air produces a noise which can be heard with infrasound. The infrasound is detecting motions that occur both at the lava lake surface and also inside this bowl that can be vibrating. You don't think of a caldera this big as being an air mass that may be going up and down. No. But that's what we have discovered. The crater actually acts as a musical instrument. So we can't hear infrasound, but we can speed it up and we can make it audible. Here's an example of the infrasound being sped up by a factor of 40. This to me is exciting. I see the data, it's good, good quality, mm -hmm. and I am happy. So I do believe that infrasound is a fundamental tool for volcano monitoring and not too far down the road, we will be able to use infrasound monitoring here to better forecast Nyiragongo's next eruption. Well, we want to develop techniques which allow us to uh, monitor the volcano cheaply, but also safely. So anything we can pull data from digitally and look at in, a, in another location, maybe on the other side of the planet, is good news. But despite that, it is clear that that volcano needs to be monitored more closely with all of the cutting edge tools we have because of the people living around us. And that has value not just for understanding the behavior of Niragongo, but the tools and technologies and the science we develop at Niragongo can potentially be applied to volcanoes elsewhere on Earth. Was certainly frightening when I got hit. I thought, this is really stupid. I shouldn't be here. But you're right. Boris, Boris. I'm Boris, or Boris, and I am a volcanologist working on Mount Etna and other Italian volcanoes. Etna is certainly one of the most active volcanoes on Earth, so Etna erupts virtually all the time. These paroxysms are characterized by the, 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 the formation of huge lava fountains, many hundreds of meters, sometimes more than 1,000, 1,500 meters high. This eruption emitted approximately 100 million cubic meters of magma. What might have become a possibly threatening and destructive flank eruption became an extremely spectacular summit eruption. What was maybe a bit more outstanding this year was the, the sheer quantity, the sheer size of these parks, and they were all big. All active volcanoes are potentially dangerous. There is no safe volcano. So volcanoes, active volcanoes are not safe. And sometimes um, potentially hazardous and dangerous events can take place also in conditions where you usually would not expect them. There was this um, steam explosion in 2017, which uh, involved uh, a lot of people, including a BBC crew and uh, yours truly. was certainly frightening. <laughs> Given the quantity of rock projectiles that came down, was how, how are we going to get out of this? When I got hit, I thought, okay, here we go, and thought, this is, this is really stupid, I shouldn't be here. The main problem at Etna has been the fallout of what we call pyroclastic material. Pyroclastic material is fragments of volcanic rock created by uh, explosive activity that rips the magma when it comes to the surface into fragments. When this material falls over inhabited areas, it covers everything. Sometimes pretty gloomy scenes. You, you, you drive into that sector that has been stricken by the fallout maybe one hour before, 
and everything is black, it becomes a continuous carpet. And um, what happens is when this material lies on roads, the roads become slippery, almost as though this were snow. There have been deadly accidents. Uh, one thing that they do here, unfortunately, is they use these, these blowers. So they... They're blowing this material from one place to another just to remove it from a sidewalk, maybe. And they create an enormous, enormous quantity of dust, including the, the well-known PM10 fraction, which is uh, respirable and which can even get into your blood. And that's where problems can become more urgent. So people obviously already suffering from respiratory problems will uh, have more trouble with that. And there is also some suspicion that long-term exposure to these very, very fine uh, dust particles can lead to uh, pathologies like cancer, thyroid cancer, and so on. So this is, these are all reasons why we definitely need a system to treat this material. They have never planned for this. There is no plan for this. And you can understand that these people get really desperate. They get really, really, really sick of it. Well, we, we do keep our volcanoes under surveillance. We have uh, seismographs. We can measure how volcanoes swell. We use GPS for that. We use satellite radar, strain meters, a microphone to, re to record infrasound signals. We measure gas emissions. We measure magnetism and gravity. We have video cameras. We have thermal cameras. We use radar. So what, what, whatever can be used to capture volcanic signals is being used. and. Yet, it can only record the signals that the volcano is ready to give us. People ask us, with all the instruments that we have, that you have, with all those instruments, with all the money that you get, you're not capable of telling us what the volcano is going to do in the next 15 years? We can tell only things about what the volcano is going to do once the volcano tells us. It will certainly happen. There will certainly be the next serious and potentially very destructive of, uh, eruption of Etna. There's no way around it. It's inevitable. There's this old Japanese saying that, that uh, in the moment that everybody will have forgotten the last disaster, the next one will strike. People cannot imagine what can happen. We do not know very precisely what process creates the magma that feeds Etna. It's, it's, it's very, very fascinating. It's, it's sometimes a bit confusing and there's still a lot of mystery to it. Yeah, so how can we deal with future volcanic crises, future volcanic events? Certainly, we cannot prevent them. Certainly, the volcano is teaching us important lessons and we uh, need to pass them on to the people to tell them, we need to tell them the mantra of international disaster mitigation and prevention, which is uh, awareness and preparedness. There's a lot of work to be done there, and we do it especially with the young people, uh, because um, they might be the ones that will change things. Five meters, two meters, oh my God. If you took in one breath, it was going to kill you. It looks like the surface of the sun. It looks like all of my wildest dreams. Yeah, it was certainly visual heroin. God, that took from, I don't know, about 15 years, probably a million dollars. I think we had had roughly 25 or 30 days of bad weather and we finally got a good weather day and we managed to get um, to the bottom. This part about this is on the way down, it's all gravity. Uh, Nathan, I'm starting to move now on belay. To be honest, I was never worried about the lava at all. Rockfall was, the, um, was our biggest uh, fear of all. So if you're halfway down inside the volcano then you, you, and it rains, you're getting rocks raining down around you that the rain has caused as well as 
battery acid strength um, acid rain. Trying to clear rocks. Ah, oh, this is not good. Yeah, kind of hell. <laughs> We're about 150 metres above the lava lake. And uh, as you can see, we've uh, come a long way. And it's mind boggling. And, uh, and there's the goal down there. That's the cursed lava lake that's sucked up my money for 15 years. <laughs> and many futile attempts to get here. As we got down the cliff, um, and I realised that it was actually going to be successful, yeah, it, it, was, it was pretty good. And I wasn't waiting to put the suit on. I wanted to have a quick look. Five metres. Two metres. Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. You have no idea how ridiculously small you look. Severe radiant heat doesn't go around corners, it's like light, um, until you actually walk to the edge and could actually see the lava. Then you were hit by a wave of heat that was, you know, uh, much like um, putting your head in a furnace, I guess. Yeah, it was beyond my wildest dreams. You could only withstand that heat for a matter of seconds before you had to. Um, turn away. Am I close enough to the edge for that breath? <laughs> I can't go any closer. If you took in one breath of that superheated air, uh, it was going to kill you. I'm getting the sun tan. What does it look like? <laughs> right. It looks like the surface of the sun. It looks like all of my wildest dreams into one moment. Once we came back with the Breathing apparatus and the heat suit on and everything, I was able to stay there for like oh, three quarters of an hour. You wouldn't believe how hot that was. Without the, when those big pulses of uh, lava come up, um, if it wasn't for the breathing, the air from the breathing tanks and the, um, the heat suit, it'd probably just about kill you. <laughs> Even with the heat suit on, it's um. It's like being in an oven, um, one or two minutes, even with the breathing apparatus, all this stuff on. The lava's probably 30 metres away, and it's um, just the most incredible heat. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing to describe it, <laughs> nothing on earth. It's like looking into the sun, it's kind of cool. I still reckon that shot is one of the greatest volcano shots of all time. <laughs> How many unsuccessful attempts were there before we got down? I don't know. Uh, probably a dozen at a hundred grand each. Um, yeah, a lot. Uh, you know, there were some crazy incidents. There was um, uh, one occasion a helicopter got hijacked. Um, another time the boat got hijacked uh, along with all our stuff. So it's like the Wild West. We finally ironed all those out. We finally got to the bottom. What kind of happened when we first got people to the bottom? We started taking private um, people who had enough money to pay to do it. That became quite successful. So what, what sort of clientele do you have? I can't even tell you. Uh, we've had a, a, a member of a royal family, I can't tell you any more than that. I can tell you I was pretty, uh, how would I put it, myself, that we didn't lose, um, a, you know, a, a member of the royal family. Because <laughs> um, I, I guess I'd be in hiding somewhere. <laughs> Everything was going well. Uh, we were finally getting um, what we thought was going to be a vi good viable business going on this remote island. In late December, this fissure eruption opened up on the side of Marum. What it actually did was that it emptied the lava lakes. There appeared to have been a number of earthquakes, including a very big one. 
and whether the magma chamber was empty, we don't know, but um, for some reason the whole of Marum and Benbo caved in. Uh, well, at first I couldn't, I didn't really believe um, the scale of what people were telling me, um, and so I went up to went up to the island and went up there in the helicopter, um, and that's when we realised that uh, as we approached the island, I realised straight away that the whole place had um, destroyed itself. Uh, we came, we succeeded, all in good time. Um, of something that no longer exists um, in a way that makes it even better. Um, you know, we can truly say that we've stood on ground that um, no one else did and no one else ever will stand on. It's kind of cool. Humans are certainly not in charge of this planet. Um, we're just, um, you know, at the mercy of nature. So the Great Wildebeest Migration in Northern Tanzania is truly one of the most spectacular natural phenomena to witness in East Africa. Every year, over one million wildebeest, accompanied by several hundred thousands of zebras, antelopes, and of course predators that will follow along that migration path. The entire distance that this migration uh, takes every year is over a thousand kilometers per year. My name is Simon Kubler, I'm a geologist. Aldonio Lengai is a very interesting and unique volcano that is located in northern Tanzania from a tectonic, volcanic and ecological point of view. This uh, volcano is, yeah, is very interesting. Well, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's super strange. Aldonio Lengai is the only active carbonatite volcano in the world. Carbonatite is a kind of melt that is very rich in carbonates. So it has a lot of um, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium um, stored in the melt. And the lava is not only chemically fascinating, it also has, it has fascinating um, physiological properties. It has the coolest lava in the world. The carbonatitic lava melts at only 500 degrees, which is less than half the temperature of uh, which other lava would normally melt. This forms a, yeah, a very special and very unique volcano that is, yeah, there's only one of those volcanoes in the world. I'm mostly interested in, in Ordonio Lenga from the point of view of how the volcanic ash after these um, explosive eruptions influence the soils in the immediate vicinity or the wider vicinity of the, of the volcano. So we, we went to uh, northern Tanzania to analyze the interplay between volcanic activity of Odonio Lengai in connection with large-scale animal migrations. Uh, the longest time they would spend actually in the Serengeti Plains um, where they also give birth to uh, uh, to their to their young, so there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, young wildebeest being born each year. And this observation um, kind of triggers the thought that some of the regions in the Serengeti are better suited for a large number of wildebeest to stay for a long time than others. We've considered several factors that might influence the, this large-scale annual migration from a geological point of view. And Odonio Lengai stands out as one of the central uh, geological features that controls this ecosystem dynamic. The volcanic ash has a very important meaning for the quality or the fertility of the soils in the Serengeti Plains. So what happens is that these very small ash particles are being deposited 
on the surface of, um, of the Serengeti plains and they will slowly get integrated in the soil. So that means that after some time vegetation will start growing on these very young surfaces and will incorporate the minerals that are um, that uh, th this volcanic ash contains. It kind of just uh, uh, serves as a kind of nutrient engine of the uh, of the wildebeest migration. The composition of the Oldonio-Langai volcanic ash is of particular importance for the nutrition of wildebeest because it has a lot high amount of calcium. Also, the amount of plant available or water soluble phosphate is very low in many soils in the East African Rift. But the soils that develop on ashes of Odonio Lengai have both high amounts of calcium and high amounts of uh, plant available phosphate. So these two minerals are very important for a balanced nutrition of newborn wildebeest that need a lot of calcium and phosphate to develop strong bones or a strong skeleton. So it's kind of a wildebeest baby food that is uh, provided uh, in, in that region. And most of the time, wildebeest would suffer from a slight degree of undernutrition. And only when, when wildebeest would enter the Serengeti Plains, those nutrient levels would be high enough that the no undernutrition would basically be detected. If the activity of Odenio Lenga were to stop immediately, it would probably have a drastic impact on the soils of the Serengeti Plains. So what would probably happen over time is that the soil quality would gradually go down in the Serengeti Plains. Yeah, it would probably have a large impact on that, on that wilderness migration. Understanding the geological setting of an ecosystem might be extremely important to also understand the long-term stability of this ecosystem. So basically, if you think about shifting an ecosystem from, from, the, from the area where it's located right now to slightly to the north or slightly to the south, you wouldn't only change the climatic, uh, the, the climatic system or, or the maybe biological features, but you would also change the location of the ecosystem with respect to the underlying geology. And this might have drastic um, influences on the long-term stability of these patterns. Normally, volcanoes are known for their, uh, yeah, for their destructive force once an eruption starts. But one thing that particularly fascinates me is that these geological features have an extremely important beneficial meaning for ecosystems, for animal landscape interactions, and nonetheless also for human landscape interactions. So it's not only the destructive force of these geological processes that are um, fascinating to study, but it's especially the uh, two sides of these uh, of these processes that can either be destructive or beneficial.